This algebraic geometry video will give some more examples of resolutions of singularities. So the first example we're going to look at is the equation x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals z squared. So this is a historically rather famous equation that was used by Pierre de Fermat in his proof that x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals z to the 4 has no integer solutions apart from the trivial one. He in fact showed that this equation here has no integer solutions. Anyway, we're not going to discuss Fermat's work on this equation. Instead, we're going to look at the singularities of this equation. So we can find the singularities by differentiating with respect to x, y, and z. So we find 4x cubed equals naught, 4y cubed equals naught, and 2z equals naught for a singular point, which obviously shows the only singular point is the origin. So now we're going to resolve the singularity of the origin by blowing up at the origin. So we're going to blow up the point 0, 0, 0. So this is a subset of A cubed. So we're going to work inside A cubed times P squared, and we're going to introduce new variables, big X, BY, and big Z for P squared. And um, we get the equations x times big y equals y times big x x times big z equals z times big x and y times big z equals z times big y and now as usual this copy of projective space is covered by three open affine sets because we can take big z equals one or big y equals one or big x equals one if we take big Z equals 1, then we write x equals z times x, y equals z times y, and we find z to the 4, x to the 4, um, plus um, z to the 4, y to the 4 equals z squared, or z squared x to the 4 plus c squared y to the 4 equals 1. And you can easily check this is um, uh, non-singular. So let's look instead at y equals 1. Um, so this time we put um, x equals y times big X and z equals um, y times big Z. And our equation becomes um, y to the 4 x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals y squared z squared. Now we can divide this out by y squared and we get y squared x to the 4 plus y squared equals z squared. Now if we check for singularities of this equation we, we see uh, we, we check for singularities by differentiating with respect to x, y, and z. So we have y squared times 4x cubed equals naught. If we differentiate with respect to x, if we differentiate with respect to y, we find 2y times x to the 4 plus 1 equals naught. And if we differentiate with respect to z, we find 2z equals naught. And now you notice that and we get singular points whenever y equals z equals zero. So these are all singular. So we have an entire line of singular points. And if we put y equals one, we get something very similar. In fact, we get more or less the same line. What is in fact going on is we've got an entire projective line of singular points, and this is one of the affine pieces covering it. So this is different from the Duval singularities we had in the previous lecture, where we blew up a point of the singularity and we kept on getting singular points. So here we've blown up a point and now we've got a singular line. So you might think this has made the singularity worse because the dimension of the singularity has got bigger, but that's misleading. Um, the, the nastiness of a singularity is really more to do with its co-dimension than with its dimension. So singularity, of 
one tend to be easier to deal with than singularities of co-dimension two. So turning a point into a line is actually good. Anyway, if we want, we can continue and finish resolving this. So we've got the equation y squared x to the four plus y squared equals z squared. And now we can resolve this singularity by blowing up along this line y equals z equals zero. So let's introduce two new variables, s colon t for a copy of p1, and we introduce the equations s times z equals t times y. And now we can, for example, um, um, cover this affine line by two, sorry, this projective line by two copies of an affine line. We either set s equals one or t equals one. If we set s equals one, we find z equals t y, and our equation becomes y squared x to the four plus y squared equals t squared y squared. We can now divide by y and we get x to the four plus one is equal to t squared, which you can easily check is non-singular. And similarly, if we look at t equals one, we again find that we get a non-singular line. So we've resolved the singularity of our original equation in two steps. First, we blow up a singular point and then we blow up a singular line. And when we've done this, we end up with um, a non-singular variety. Um, the next example, well, I've been giving a lot of examples where blowing up a singular point or line makes the singularity better. If you choose your blow up badly, you can actually make the singularity worse. So let's have a look at x squared minus yz equals naught. So this is just a cone. It's got a conical singularity at the origin, which is easy enough to resolve by blowing up the origin as we did in an earlier example. Well, suppose instead of doing that, let's blow up along the line y equals z equals zero. So what we do is we introduce two new coordinates, um, y comma z in a projective line. So this is in a cubed and we're now going to be working in a cubed times p1. And um, we introduce the usual extra equations for the blow up y times big z equals z times big y. And now, as usual, we take one of the affine lines um, that forming a cover of p1. So we can take either big z equals one or big y equals one. So if we take um, big y equals one, we make the substitution z equals y times big z, and our equation becomes x squared minus y squared z equals zero. So we started off with a fairly simple conical singularity, and we've now got this more complex singularity, so this is now the Whitney umbrella. has definitely got rather more complicated. You see this equation only has degree two, and by blowing up, we've actually turned it into a degree three equation, which is clearly more complicated than, than this one. So the, the point of this is you need to be a little bit careful about where you blow things up. It doesn't automatically make things better. It can make them worse. Um, next, we have an example from number theory. So. In number theory, we can look at the ring z and join the square root minus three. And this ring has the problem it doesn't have unique factorization. Um, for instance, we have two times two equals one plus root minus three times one minus root minus three. And unique factorization doesn't hold and so on. Um, well, what does this have to do with singularities in algebraic geometry? Well, what we're going to do is pretend that this is a coordinate ring of a variety. 
Now, actually, it isn't a coordinate ring of a variety. It's actually a coordinate ring of a scheme that we will be studying later, but we haven't actually covered schemes, so we're going to pretend it's the coordinate ring of a variety. And um, what are the points of this variety? Well, the points are going to correspond to maximal ideals. So although it's not really a variety with the points, we can still look at the maximal ideals. And it's got a maximal ideal generated by 2 and root minus 3. Um, this isn't a principal ideal domain, so the maximal ideals aren't necessarily um, um, generated by one element. And what we're going to do is try and show that in some sense, the variety corresponding to this, or scheme corresponding to this, has a singular point at this point here, where we're pretending that maximal ideals are points. So what we should do is we should look at the local ring near this point, and we can um, take the local ring to be z2 root minus 3. So z2 is the ring you get by inverting all, um, all uh, primes not equal to 2. Um, so this is now a local ring. And the maximal ideal of this local ring is now generated by 2 and root minus 3 minus 1. Uh, sorry, this maximal ideal should have been 2 root minus 3 minus 1. Uh, this thing isn't a maximal ideal. It's the whole ring. So we have a maximal ideal that I'm going to call M. And if let's call this ring, let's call uh, this local ring R, then R over M is a field. It's just the field with two elements, as you can use. Um, and R over M squared has order eight. Again, it's not too difficult to check. So m over m squared has order 4 and is a two-dimensional vector space over um, r over m. And this space here, you remember, is really the cotangent space at um, this point corresponding to the maximal ideal. So we can work out the dimension of this ring, by which we mean the Kroll dimension, which is the greatest length of chains of prime ideals, and um, the only prime ideals are either zero or maximal ideal. So this ring R has dimension one. And now we've got a point where the cotangent space at this point M has dimension two, which is bigger than the dimension of the ring, so it corresponds to a singular point or at least it would if this was a variety, which it isn't, but never mind. And the fact that this is not a unique factorization domain turns out to be related to the fact that it has a singular point. Um, roughly speaking, the fact that it's got a singular point implies that this can't have unique factorization. The converse doesn't actually hold. There are some um, rings of algebraic integers that have no singular points but still don't have unique factorization. But anyway, we can now resolve the singularity. And there are several ways of doing this. We can resolve this singularity by blowing up. Um, we won't do this. Um, in number theory, you resolve the singularity by taking something called the normalization of the ring or the interval closure. And taking the integral closure of z root minus 3 gives you the ring z root minus 3, sorry, root minus 3 plus 1 over 2. So if we call this element here omega, then omega squared plus omega plus 1 is equal to 0. So omega is an algebraic integer lying in the field of this. And that's what you do in algebraic number theory to take the um, integral closure. Anyway, 
This ring does have unique factorization, for which you can go to any algebraic number theory course, and its points are non-singular. So we can say this is non-singular. So taking the integral closure of this ring is sort of the same as taking a desingularization of a variety. If we pretend this is the coordinate ring of a variety, then this would be the coordinate ring of a desingularization of that variety. Um, except, of course, as I said, they're not really varieties, they're really schemes. Um, so, um, so the, the, the process of taking the integral closure of an order of an algebraic number field in number theory is really almost the same as um, resolving the singularities of an algebraic curve. Um, next, I want to give an example of application of resolution of singularities. So you know, here, here I'll prove this great theorem that you could resolve the singularities of any variety in characteristic zero, and it's supposed to have large numbers of important applications, so I thought I would give uh, a rather sketchy description of one particular application of it. Um, so you all know the gamma function is given the integral zero to infinity minus t, t to the s minus 1 dt. And this converges for the real part of s greater than 0. And you can extend it to an meromorphic function of s. by um, integrating by parts um, in the usual way. And this is the question posed. We've got a polynomial in several variables, f of x1 up to xn, and we multiply it by some smooth, compactly supported function phi. And we're going to take this to the power of s. So this is going to be some polynomial and integrate with respect to dx1 up to dxn. So this is smooth, compact support. And um, this um, is going to be a holomorphic function of s if the real part of s is reasonably large. And the problem is, can we analytically continue to all s. So you can see this is more or less the same as the gamma function. So f would correspond to the very simplest polynomial, um, um, just t. And phi would correspond to e to the minus t. And yes, I know e to the minus t doesn't have compact support, but frankly, I don't really care. Um, and the problem arises because f might be zero somewhere. You see, if f is never zero, there's absolutely no problem um, analytically continuing this because this is just a perfectly well-defined finite number. So the problem occurs at the zeros of f. And the zeros of f will be some sort of hypersurface with singularities. And the more complicated the singularities are, the more difficult it is to figure out what on earth is going on in this integral. And Atia pointed out there was a very easy way to settle this question. What you do is you just resolve the singularities of the equation f equals zero. So you use Hironaka's theorem to resolve the singularities of the variety f equals zero. Now, what you end up with when you do that isn't actually a non-singular space, because when you blow up singularities, according to Hironaka's theorem, you introduce all these exceptional curves. Um, now, the exceptional curves don't really matter because they all cross um, um, transversally. 
So when you resolve singularities by blowing up repeatedly, strictly speaking, you don't quite resolve them. What you end up with is a lot of singularities that look like things like x1, x2, xk equals zero. So we just have a lot of hyperplanes all intersecting at right angles to each other. So we can, doing this, we reduced the case of integrals like x1, x2, xn to the s times phi of x1, xn, and so on, dx1 to xn equals zero. And this is really easy to do because this just splits as a lot of integrals of the form um, like x1 to the s times f of x1 dx1 equals zero. And you can do this one in just the same way that you do the gamma function by integrating by parts. So the resolution of singularities um, allows you to prove meromorphic continuation of integrals like this. Actually, shortly after, or maybe at the same time that Atiyah found this proof using resolution of singularities, Bernstein found a, um, a much more elementary and very ingenious way of proving analytic continuation of these functions using polynomials he introduced called Bernstein polynomials, also called Bernstein-Sato polynomials because Sato discovered them at a similar time. So this particular example is mainly maybe kind of cheating slightly because it turned out you don't really need the full power of Hieronarchus theorem to prove this analytic continuation, but it at least shows uh, a sort of typical way in which you can use resolution of singularities to prove things. Okay, the next lecture will be about um, completions of local rings and what they have to do with singularities.